welcome. Welcome, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, participants around the world. Welcome to the next, the second of the series of the um, Peatlands and Climate Commitment Commitments um, webinar uh, session, implementing climate action through, through peatlands. In the next two hours, we're going to explore with experts, but also with you. So how can we bring peatlands better into our NDCs? How can we make that work? What we've really decided and what we've really learned from the first sessions and recently from COP is that it's really important to open the dialogue and not only have direct, uh, not only have direct presentations by people, but also have, to also have the space for you to ask us questions and together to learn and together find where the, 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 the struggles are, where the bottlenecks are, but also where the solutions are, because we've got quite a lot of people around the table that can provide answers. So over the next two hours, I'm really proud that as um, Wetlands International, in partnership with the Global Peatlands in Initiative Partners, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Greifswald Meyer Center and the Ramsau Convention and Wetlands, Wetlands Secretariat and the UNEP, United, United Nations Environment Fair Program, we're really proud to host this, this webinar with you. And we all hope that we can learn together and really push our understanding on how to include peatlands in NDCs, but also how to deliver on the ground and really make that happen. This decade is where it is important. This decade is where we really need to take action and not only talk about action, but take that action. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm Hans Hutten. Um, I'm the program head climate smart land use at Wetlands International, and I will be the moderator of this session. And as I said, um, in our program that we go into the next slide, there we are. In that program, we've got some welcome remarks for me here, and we'll go through that now. Um, then there will be two presentations lined up, one from Maria Nutinen, the Forestry Officer of the FAO, on peatlands implementing climate action. And then a second presentation from Jan Peters, the Managing Director of the Michael Succo Foundation and a partner in Greifswald Meyer Center on the Global Peatland Assessment and the Global Peatland Map. For the Q&A session, then a third presentation of, of a country, of a real case study from a country, the lessons learned from Uganda. And I'm really pleased to have Asadu Sesi Boto there to talk through their lessons. And then we got some Q and A's. What we then after that do is have a quick video tour of what's actually happening in the Scottish Highlands. At this moment in time, I am based in Scotland and a lot of that is a lot of things are happening there. And I'm really proud that we've got a, a video there showing what's happening here. What, what are the issues? What are we doing that? And also get you a real feeling of action on the ground. After that, we've got a really talk to the expert session whereby we've got quite an open platform whereby you can ask questions, whereby we're using questions from the previous sessions and from the, the COP to really delve into the detail and ask ask us on how to move forward and also um, suggest things. Then we've got the role of partnerships and the impact of international collaboration with Diana Kopansky, the, um, the GPI coordinator, and Romeo Bertoloni from the NDC partnership. And then Jerke Tamalander from the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands will wrap up. So that's the program for the next, for the next two hours. Um, next bit. Some housekeeping rules before we really start. First of all, this meeting will be recorded. It's handy for us to have this as a backdrop, but also we will make it available afterwards so you can listen in and look back again. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box and the Q&A box is at the bottom of the screen. That is the best and not the chat. You can vote for your favorite questions. So they come up the list and they will be answered by the, um, by the panelists and will be answered by the experts around the table. And the chat is also open for additional comments. So that's my introduction to this session. I'm really proud to be here and I'm really glad that we are here and helping the world to take action and very much needed action on peatlands to solve and to deal with the twin crisis of climate and biodiversity. So that's my, my introduction and I'm now going to hand over to um, Maria Nutinen. Maria Nutinen is the forestry officer of the Forest and Climate Change and Adaptation 
climate change adaptation with mitigation synergies for the forest and climate team, the forestry division of the FAO. Maria, that's a very big one, big mouthful, and I'm really proud to have you here. So the floor is yours to share your experience on implementing of peatlands, implementing climate action. Thanks a lot, Hans, and thanks to Wetlands International for organizing this, uh, this session today. And indeed, it is a continuation of a previous session that we uh, organized already jointly in, in June. I'm just having one tiny technical issue here. One second, I'm going to solve this. Okay, I think we're ready to go. What a wonderful timing. So we had a busy COP uh, yeah, at the, for the climate change for the Ramsar Convention and now ongoing on biodiversity. So indeed a great time to also talk about synergies and how to implement really this, um, for example, the ambition for in, on peatlands in different, under different frameworks. So this presentation is a compilation of not only my and Elizabeth work, who is also here uh, online, but a whole range of experts. So we're kind of trying to summarize in 12 minutes uh, a lot of information. So please do ask in questions because there's not that much time to dive into uh, more into detail in different topics. Um, why we're talking about peatlands, if there is somebody who is this a totally new topic, I tried to summarize in one slide here um, why the losing of peatlands through drainage and fires threatens the ecosystem services and a lot of benefits that we are getting from peatlands. So it's not only greenhouse gas emissions from the drainage, also the loss of biodiversity, diversity, as peatlands are often habitat for many species that have been kind of maybe <laughs> Um, pushed out from other areas and also very adapted, diverse, rich uh, species, different types of species and the whole ecosystem, how it works together. There's also a lot of carbon loss and impacts on the water systems when peatlands are drained and land degradation, of course, uh, because peatlands are very vulnerable when they are exposed to, to uh, oxygen. And indeed, of course, let's not forget the increased fire frequency that many countries, surpri surprising ones, even uh, are noticing in the areas in the past, uh, dry, past dry years. Let's not also forget that there's this direct linkage from the, these ecosystem services that peatlands provide to adaptive capacity and resilience of, uh, of uh, communities, even cities, and the peatlands are also cooling the local climate. Here, I'm just trying to summarize um, the key planning and implementation instruments that already exist, especially under the um, Climate Change Framework Convention, UNFCCC, but also other frameworks. So uh, before, or even when we started uh, talking about climate change that much, there, there were wetland strategies and peatland strategies and more and more common. And now many countries are doing climate strategies, land use, Ones. And those need to be, of course, aligned with the national plans. Then after that, we ha started having them national adaptation plans as a, as a framework, but not all countries have done this. It's a very important process and of course adaptive ones because uh, we, we, we see only with the time how climate is changing. But it, peatlands can be also integrated there, for example, through the flooding flood risks. Um, the nationally determined contributions are actually commitments, as we call them, climate commitments, together with the long-term targets, LTSs, which allow the country to kind of plan ahead and announce to, to the international community, we are about to do this, especially we are about to do this if we get more funding and therefore kind of chart the way for the activities to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement goals. And after that, of course, what is logical, there would be the NDC implementation plans, for example, what uh, Peru is putting together now uh, for the Amazonas. And also other mitigation actions, uh, sometimes uh, done under the reducing emission from, from deforestation and forest degradation, um, the Red Plus framework, uh, the NAMAS as one frame of the countries has been using, and then um, national budgeting. Let's not forget that because you always need the resources. That's already inbuilt in the NAP process, but not always taken into account uh, everywhere when we're doing, for example, nationally determined contributions. The budget is a very essential part of being able to achieve and implement um, the activities. 
Then, of course, there is a lot of activities that countries are doing just through the normal policy and regulatory framework and enforcement of the laws and regulations. And then finally, of course, there is also the international framework where we are monitoring and reporting on the activities that are uh, being implemented. So there should be a kind of a linkage and kind of harmonization across all this, which is a challenging task, but at the national level, this is how the implementation could go. Of course, in private sector civil society, it's as nice that if it's very aligned to the national level activities, but now we were talking especially on the public sector context. So what's the current situation? Uh, peatlands are underrepresented uh, in the nationally determined contributions. Uh, so according to our latest uh, review that we conducted with the uh, FAO Climate Change and Biodiversity Office and the Chrysler Meyer Center uh, by the COP, uh, sorry, the end of September, we had the only 13% of the parties who had submitted uh, the NDCs um, included peatlands as, as that keyword. More countries included wetlands as a topic, but it's a kind of a surprising matter considering how important the peatlands carbon storage and emissions already are. So when the, I'd also, again, this is a summary slide. So the key principles, how, how peatlands implement, how, how we can implement climate action on peatlands is summarized here that the sustainable management really requires that the water levels are at or near the surface biggest part of the year. This is not always the case in tropical peatlands where the fluctuation may be um, more um, bigger, but of course it, this is the mean of the year and most of the year, this is the way how to maintain the peatlands. The peat body integrity, so this means for example, the extraction of peat or other types of uh, disturbance to the mass of the biomass forming the which is the peat then finally the wetland plant, wetland plant species uh, which is are forming and constructing the peat slowly by slowly millimeter, millimeter per millimeter um, per year that's uh, that's how the peat keeps on replenishing and also sequestering carbon the priority, priority strategies are, first of all, this is the most important one, conservation and protection of those approximately 85% of peatlands are, that are still intact in a good condition, but also advancing when there are degraded peatlands. So the second point uh, to restore the peatlands and then eventually, hopefully get to the point where you could also conserve the areas once the ecosystem functions have been recovered. And finally, there is the option for adap adaptive management. Um, this would mean, for example, a bit lower water tables, but please note that because we are trying to collectively achieve the net zero, this adaptive management would not should not go beyond the 2050. This kind of strategy was we already outlined actually 10 years ago um, in a publication um, that done big part of this with the same partners. Um, here I want to draw your attention um, for a bit more information in a structured manner on how the NDCs can be enhanced, so how countries can do more climate commitments, for example, with peatlands. This is a report that came out just um, in November, um, together with 35 contributors, contributors and 11 organizations. Um, key elements there are, for example, the, the process of how you enhance the uh, NDCs and the, how you could mobilize the finance for, for planning, for the planning process. Um, and we'll share the links for this also in the chat. Just one diving in one of the mechanisms that I was outlining in the beginning, the national adaptation plans and actions. So here, this is something that many of us are still learning a lot about. The main action, main focus here is the redu reduction of the vulnerability, uh, building the ad adaptive capacity and resilience, for example, after shocks and, and, um, and the disasters, how the communities bounce back. And it can also include disaster risk reduction, for example, uh, peatland fire components. There's, you should think about both the medium and long-term adaptation needs and implement them to address these. It's an iterative process, as said, and synergies should, should be soaked with, for example, with the sustainable development goals, ending poverty, and so forth. 
Then when you think about, we underline already the resources, um, for example, Indonesia has already considered this very carefully, how to blend different finance sources to be able to achieve sometimes very ambitious targets for restoring peatlands, for example. So but the public finance still is the most important uh, source of, uh, of resources where how this can be done. Um, for example, considering positive intent incentives or revision of the um, tax uh, structure, what kind of incentives are we giving to, to um, for example, companies to revet areas that they've been using. Then the private and blended financing. Of course, the international financing mechanism, for example, uh, the men once mentioned here, are getting a lot of attention. However, the funds are limited. So to, in order to really implement at a large scale, there needs to be other funds considered and, and combined with them. Bilateral funds, here we are listing just a few examples, but some, some um, countries who are already been um, promoting, for example, peatland related to mitigation or adaptation activities and so forth. There's indeed in, in our report, there's a lot more information about that. I think I'm running a bit uh, low on time. So let me just go to the next slide, even though of course regulations incentives are really important. Um, but this is also one area where we've been investing a lot more with our, through our organization, the people are monitoring why it's important because it also proves in a transparent manner, for example, to the donors or financial sources that it, the targets are actually being achieved. Um, they help accessing finance. So monitoring the change of peatlands is critically important. As we know also now the temperatures are raising, the rainfall patterns are getting more erratic. There are changes that are also happening because of the sheer uh, climatic change. But when we're doing restoration, especially, we should be aware how are the activities that we're implementing sufficient? Are the water tables getting up? Is it peatland getting wetter? Um, are we getting the, the results that we are expecting? And if not, maybe we should adapt the, the management. And also monitoring should be combining now with the early warning, early action systems, especially when considering floods and fires. Some ways forward, um, what is needed, and I'm hopefully Yerker can tell a bit more also on the assessment that is required, for example, through the Ramsar Convention, on wetlands uh, to ask both the, to have the maps available and then the assessment of the degradation of peatlands and then integrating peatlands into all already ongoing monitoring systems, for example, for forestry. The stakeholder involvement is very important. As we know, a lot of different communities are in, and, and stakeholders are active on peatland areas. And if we're not effectively bringing everybody to the same table and having a say, it's very much impossible to, to implement a just transition in the management, how we, how we deal with peatlands. One thing I want to stop a little bit further is the capacity to implement climate action. And this is where something where we've been, we will need to invest a lot more. Um, one thing is that we've been observing and also through a, through um, kind of a capacity assessments that we've been conducting globally and nationally, uh, there's a big need on, on being able to do peatland mapping very specific skills, inventories, land use planning, management, transparency matters, economic solutions. This is especially something, an area where more work needs to be happening. And also how you develop projects, how you uh, access funding, uh, how you implement at a large scale. So coordination mechanisms are also very important and not always easy. So some of the take home messages just to summarize, is a new work area for many countries. Many of the 185 countries, at least, who have those contained peatlands are not very well, well aware of them. And there are needs for peatland mapping or updating them and in the, being aware where the peatlands actually are degraded and emitting. Um, both also, we need to understand better what are the real challenges on terms of, for example, adapting to the climate exchanges, where we should focus uh, our work. And let me just close by saying the social economic solutions and the capacity to implement a scale really needs a bit more uh, emphasis from all, of, from all of us. Thank you so much and happy to share further information, both in writing and, and in the question and answer session.
Thanks. Over to you, Hans. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for a very quick whistle-stop tour of a very extensive report. And there are so many important um, aspects that you raise. It's good to see that. It's really good to hear that. Um, by now, we've got over 120 attendees, so it's brilliant from all over the world. So please use the Q&A um, bit at the bottom of the screen to launch your questions, and then we will pick them up later after the, the next one. And yeah, please use that either now or a bit later on during the, uh, the panel so we can grab the questions and get them all lined up. So thank you. Thanks, Maria, for doing this. Um, very interesting. It's, it always excites me to see how, much, how many angles there are but also how we can together make that, that leap forward. And talking about one of the angles, um, is, and I'd like to introduce the next speaker, this Jan Peters, the Managing Director of the Michael Sukov Foundation and a partner in the Greifswald Meyer Center. And Jan is going to talk about the Global Peatland Assessment and the Global Peatland Map 2.0. Jan, take it away, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you a lot, Hans, uh, for the warm introduction and thanks for organizing um, this workshop by uh, Wetlands International uh, today. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, uh, to all of you from wherever you are. I'm very glad to see so many people interested in this topic, which uh, def definitely deserves it. And I was asked by the organizers to uh, speak a little bit about the global peatland assessment and especially about the global peatland map uh, 2.0, which is part of this global peatland assessment. And um, I will guide you through this. Um, and uh, I just have to mention that this uh, is, of course, not only my work, but it's very much um, uh, yeah, impacted by my colleagues, Francisca, Alexandra, and Cosima here from the Greifswald Meyer Center. Next slide, please. So the global peatland assessment is actually a long-term effort. Um, I searched my archives and I actually found this picture here uh, on the bottom left from uh, our first meeting or one of the first meetings discussing the Global Peatlands Initiative and also the Global Peatland Assessment in the first conceptual meeting which took place in FAO headquarters in Rome. I think it was also the first time when we met uh, for the first time in person with Maria in 2016. And um, here you see that actually Wetlands International was one of the driving forces behind to establish this Global Peatlands Initiative and bring it for uh, forward. And now, um, <laughs> many years later, we have the Global Peatland Assessment. You see the cover on the right side here, the main re report, which was launched uh, some some days ago at the COMP 27 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, and um, it's an impressive work actually um, with. 425 pages, more than 200 authors, co coordinating lead authors, but also contributing authors from all over the world. Um, and it will be uh, for sure the new reference for decision making on NDCs, on adaptation plans, but also for biodiversity, water management, all these things. Next slides. And the global peatland assessment, you see here the link. Um, Maybe colleagues can also put it in the in the chat uh, so that you can exit it. It has uh, different chapters. It has a, a summary for policymakers, which is highlighting the the key points um, of this assessment. I will also come back to that at the end of this this presentation. Um, it highlights why peatlands are actually important, why they are a case for assessment and action. And then, of course, it has a lot of, holds a lot of information on the global peatland extent, but also on the regional assessment uh, for, the, for the continents, um, on the distribution, but also status um, and properties of the peatlands. And uh, last but not least, it uh, also is a, is a rich uh, inventory of the policy and governance options for peatland conservation, restoration, and sustainable management. And um, yeah, here uh, you see, for example, the on this slide, this graph shows that actually 33% uh, of world's peatlands are in Asia, 32% in North America, and then the other continents, Central and South America, 13% Europe, 12% Africa, 8% and 2% in Oceania, how the peatlands are distributed worldwide. Next one. And yeah, one of the core issues, of course, is if you're considering as a country, as a party uh, to a convention to consider peatlands in policies and strategies like 
NDCs, like adaptation plans, like biodiversity uh, plans and strategies, you of course need to know um, if you have peatlands and where they are and in which status they are and what are the, the uh, um, uh, proper actions to take um, to, to manage them. So we came up with this map, which is ex actually a composite me map. So it come, there come together a lot of layers from different, different sources. So more than 200 single data sets are included in this global map. And it shows the global peatlands, organic soils, and also suitable proxy data from a peatland occurrence, like for example, vegetation, like soil maps, like maps of specific areas, like Ramsar sites, all these things went in there and um, uh, generated and analyzed together to come up with this, uh, map and we it, it applies a generic peatland definition uh, to ensure a broad uh, coverage um, across the globe. And we also supplemented uh, this with own mapping approaches with satellite imagery, but also with ground truthing in, in some of the regions um, to close gaps. But uh, to be to be uh, fully. Um, uh, transparent on that there are still a lot of gaps and this global peatland map 2.0 is definitely not the last uh, map we will see next one but it is uh, we call it an invitation to dive into the world of peatland so have a look on the on the uh, global peatland assessment you will find a lot of these um, detailed maps of different regions of different countries of different um, actually parts of countries and it's it's really interesting to see uh, the the distribution of the peatlands there um and also differentiation between deeper and shallow peat uh, and and different properties Next one. And of course, we also uh, built on this map to, to have uh, th thematic maps for the global peatland assessment. For example, here you see a map um, on the distribution of cropland on peatlands. Um, so where peat is actually drained and degraded to use it in agriculture and cropland. You see a strong focus here in Europe, but also Southeast Asia, also parts of China and North America. And these maps, of course, highlight very clearly uh, multiple land use types and land use changes, peatland protection, human pressure and biodiversity values. And uh, with this, we can identify the status, land use threats and values of peatlands comprehensively at a global scale. But of course, uh, there's also data available in the global peatland database um, to zoom in to specific countries, to specific parties who would like to uh, include this into their national strategies. Next one. Another uh, important information is, of course, about the greenhouse gas emissions from the drainage and degradation of um, Peatlands, um, we depicted also in country wise maps so that you can see very clear um, if um, your country um, has high emissions from peatlands. And um, this is also connected a lot with the UNFCC national inventory submissions from 2021 and um, from peatland soil research. And it clearly serves as a very good basis uh, for for the NDCs um, after a national adaptation to to national um, conditions. Next one. And also quite often um, the question comes up, OK, but most of the peatlands are already protected in, in protected areas. But um, we also merge these layers like we merged um, the layer of protected Peat, uh, peatlands inside and outside protected areas, which you can see here, and you, you see uh, massive uh, red spots. So it, it shows that actually most of the peatlands worldwide um, are uh, um, not in protected areas um, yet. Um, so so we, we wanted to draw additional attention to this uh, topic. And um, of course, not only looking at um, the climate perspective, but also on other ecosystem services um, like water retention and provision of uh, uh, provision of valuable um, biodiversity. And this also shows um, uh, and visualizes um, local um, land use hotspots around the world. Next one. 
So what are the key recommendations of the global peatlands assessment? Um, I would like, summarize it here. Um, so which is also very important to develop uh, NDCs is to develop, to develop and maintain data systems and inventories um, to increase the, the information and knowledge on peatlands, to expand the protected area systems on peatlands. As you have seen before on the slide, a lot of peatlands are outside protected areas still, uh, to place buffer zones around peatlands in collaboration with local communities to really um, ensure that the peat is protected, strengthen the regu regulations to prevent and hold harmful operations, initiate plans for phasing out harmful operations, like for example, example, drainage for agriculture, drainage for forestry, drainage for peat extractions or others. Um, form a fair and transparent gender responsive governance system that crosses sectors and empowers stewardship for indigenous people and local communities. To create subsidies and financial mechanism uh, that incentivize practices that support healthy peatlands. Eliminate perver perverse incentives that and disincentivize activities that are driving peatland degradation. For example, in, in Europe, we have uh, quite high payments for drained peat soils actually under agriculture and that this should stop. Use blended finances uh, to combine public and private sector funding to scale up um, peatland restoration and conservation. Establish robust uh, monitoring frameworks to ensure the success of measures and support collaboration and engage in international networks and initiatives like the Global Peatland Initiative, but also other um, regional um, initiatives and networks um, which exist in, in many, many regions worldwide. Next one. So many, many thanks to all uh, who have contributed with the data for the map, but also for the for the assessment um, itself, for the expertise, the advice, and the countless hours of work, <laughs> which are in there for many, many years, actually. Here you see a picture of a, of a coordinating these authors meeting. Hundreds of scientists across the globe uh, have contributed. I really want to thank also the development team from, from uh, UNEP, UNEP, UNEP WCMC, um, Ramza, and, and also my colleagues from Greifswald Meyer Center, um, and everything which is behind that. And thanks also for your attention. Go, thank you. Sorry, I, after two years with COVID and sitting at home, I still didn't, couldn't find my mute button. So here we are. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Maria, for two really interesting start of presentations of this two hour workshop or this two hour webinar. Just a quick reminder to you, please use the Q&A button at the bottom end of the screen to ask your questions and then we will pick them up and we can ask them to the, uh, to, to the, to, to the experts or to the presenters. In the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to ask some of the questions and pick up some of the questions to the, the two presenters that just spoke. So if Maria and Jan can please unlock their kind of, yes, yeah, switch on your cameras and, um, and are ready to answer questions. And me as, as, as moderator, um, I, I'm afraid I've always got the, the, um, the opportunity to ask the first question. So I think it's a similar question to you, Maria, and to Jan. Um, both really impressive pieces of work, both a lot of recommendations, but if you can pick up one, the most critical thing that you think that could really accelerate action on the ground, what would that be? Maria, I'll first um, ask you that question and then I'll give Jan about a minute to think about it for him to answer the same one. Yeah, thanks a lot. I am, I'm just thinking if I could, bring out something else that what wasn't in the take home messages. I think now the magic bullet is really to solve the economic question. This is also applies, by the way, for the conservation areas or increasing the conservation areas. How do we compensate for the avoided emissions? That's often a quite the tricky matter. And I know there are colleagues in the Congo Basin have been thinking a lot about this. Uh, so where does the funding would come from? How do you compensate those people for maintaining, uh, who may, those people living around and inside the peatlands for maintaining uh, what they are maintaining <laughs> as much as possible? As it, it will affect the economic possibilities. But of course, it, it brings also a lot of benefits. 
and then let alone if you have economic like um, enterprise activities there. Um, land swaps are of course some a potential mechanism that has been already been uh, tried out. But so there are already solutions for this, but I think it also needs to be like um, implemented at scale. But well, I'm curious really hearing from you, Marie, as you say, it's 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 really a, a lot around we've got knowledge we know now where they are let's go and do it but to be able to do that we need the finance the economic side in place and not only the finance coming in but also making sure that it works for the people on the ground right right and then that indeed the socioeconomic system needs to be at work thanks a lot but happy to hear what jan has to say yeah, yeah. absolutely over to jan it's very similar on the back of your <laughs> presentation and again as i said a huge amount of data together really impressive and i'm really glad it is so well available now from people around the planet but if there's one silver bullet you had a list of 13 or 14 i haven't counted them but what would be the main thing that you would say this would really make it happen yeah i can just fully support what maria and also you said that we need especially on the land use side we need solutions how people local communities um, can use their peatlands um, they haven't been drained for nothing yeah they drained it because they use the land they need the land and we have in, in many parts of the uh, world we still have like increase of population we have will have more pressure on the lands um and also with with um rising living standards uh, development and we need to find ways how to um, protect the peat on the one hand conserve and keep the carbon in the ground to fulfill our um, our needs for for climate change mitigation and adaptation but on the other side uh, also develop uh, ways and systems like for example paludi culture but also other other schemes uh, how to use it and um, for this i think also maria touched upon that this mm -hmm. um, beside the financial part i think probably even more important is the capacity how to do mm -hmm. that to really have this exchange um, from experts to local communities to really um, get them engaged and and make them aware of the peat the special properties they have actually the treasure they have in their soil and um, how to use it in the proper way i think this these are the the biggest challenges and yeah you could call it the the silver bullet uh, to to kind of tackle this issue yeah Thank you, Jan. I think I've heard several silver bullets here. So there's a range of silver, it's a salvo or silver bullets, but it's good to hear that there's not only the, the, the socioeconomic, the enabling socioeconomic conditions on the ground, but also the capacity to do that, what I really picked up from you. And that's quite important as well. Absolutely. One of the things that you really interestingly raised that has come through the questions as well is the role of cropping. But and especially then the role of cropping in terms of damaging, we all know of the, the acacia and the palm oil plantations, which have got a significant impact on the peatland resource, but then the beneficiary side of that, the polluted culture. Can you talk a little bit more about the scale of that and how that could really work, Jan? Yeah, of course I could do. Um, yeah, so for paludi culture of course this will look very different in uh, different regions and tropical regions we have completely different systems like than what we um, envisage in, in temperate or boil zones and um, uh, there are also a huge amounts of potential plants we just published i can put that in the, in the chat later uh, a new publication on the database of potential potential paludi culture plants it has a portraits of more than thousand species which are actually um, um kind of have quite a high potential and 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 look quite um promising to to really uh, serve as livelihood options for uh, for the for the communities and for the economy in these countries but they they very quite a lot. So, for example, in in Peru, we have um, systems where um, non-timber forest products are uh, taken from the forest, harvested in the forest without um, uh, destroying them, but without uh, harm uh, the peat, and it could be sold as uh, high high valuable uh, food products. In uh, Europe, uh, we have. Uh, fibers which could be used for construction materials for insulation which is highly needed um, to bet better insulate our houses um, and and um, yeah um, 
have better energy efficiency. We see in uh, Indonesia, it's a huge um, wave of all kinds of different um, plants, which can be used, for example, to replace rubber, um, uh, but also food um, plants, which are used there. Uh, but we also need to see that um, drainage-based agriculture has be, has developed over hundreds or even thousands of mm -hmm. years, and we cannot just expect that in in a few years or decades the whole system uh, develops. Absolutely. We of course we need to be fast, but we need also still work on it and develop it further. And for that, we we need everyone um, on board um, to find these Absolutely. solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. I think that's really important. And from ourselves as well, if we look about what we're doing ourselves, it's especially around the polluted culture is creating that supply chain. So tying in all the pilots that we have and making them big and commercially viable and tying them in with, with big organizations, which is one of the stumble blocks. And we are, we're working on that increasingly with the right leading people within industry. Because in the end of the day, as you say, Jan, the commercial of the agricultural situations and the drainage has developed over hundreds if not thousands of years turning that around we need to to redesign the supply chains we, we need to redesign that industry so they pick the right products that are grown in the right way and in that way just we get that harmony maria you put your hand up i'm going to give you the floor for a few yeah. minutes and then i think it's one more question before we move on to the next presentation yeah, I think just yeah, just a comment on the paludiculture side. I think it's good to also still go back to the definition. Uh, it's all you know in all the reports, but just to be very clear, we're talking about fully wet rivet or uh, wet peatlands where you would be producing the biomass, and it can be also through aquatic species. I'm just talking of this especially because we're hearing very encouraging stories and, and case, cases about which we are actually being documenting also on the fishes, fish production. Uh, peatlands are not very productive as you, in most cases. So th it ha doesn't have to be in a, in a huge scale, but it, it can be having an important economic and also nutritional impact. So not to forget that. And also I'm hearing actually our, our friends and colleagues at the Peatland Restoration, Peatland Mangrove Restoration Agency in Indonesia, that there is a, there are new innovative means to developing using the peatland fiber indeed even a, in a important industrial application. So maybe we're getting some good uh, solution also that could can compete with with um, even oil palm. Hopefully, thanks. Thank you, Maria. And rest me now just also just to make sure that we keep linking to the um, global of the the virtual peatland pavilion that we started off in COP twenty five uh, COP twenty six. That we still that we rekindled in COP27. There's a lot of information there. So if people here are asking questions in the chat of where can I find, please use the um, the um, uh, yeah the virtual peatland pavilion to look into that as well. And there's lots of information and background knowledge that you already can use and move forward. And the GPI has been really leading on that, and it's been great to see all, all that information together. So it might be if somebody could drop the link to the due to the Peatland Pavilion in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A or in the chat, that would be great. My last question, I think, to Maria before we move on is, I hear a lot in your report about NDCs, a lot about um, government action. Um, what are the, how far are we with the implementation plans? What's the action on the ground? How far are the countries getting on with it? Because we are now in 2022. Uh, towards the end of 2022. We said it is a decade of ecosystem restoration and we really need to nail it in this decade. Have you got an idea of how far are we? Are we 1% there? Are we 20% there? Are we really scaling up? Whereabouts are we, Maria? What's your gut feeling? That's a good question because we're really, when we're doing really restoration, which means in peatlands, rewetting and getting back the vegetation, the wetland vegetation, it requires a lot of effort, as said. So actually the stages of implementation, how much of those 11 to 15% of degrading, degrading peatlands are being revetted at the moment, hard to say. Uh, we have some champions here. In UK has been having a very ambitious plan, uh, Indonesia as well. Um, 
I know uh, Finland was also letting go of the um, energy production and getting the, the people who were extracting the, the peat for, for the heat generation were actually building uh, the dam construction of the dams at the peatland sites. Um, now, I think we actually, that's one next uh, step that we want to do under the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. I see some fellow members of the Monitoring Task Force are here, is to look at indeed a bit more in scale where the restoration is happening, um, to, to be able to engage more um, effectively also with different actors and see, you know, even what are the lessons learned, where to do better. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. And I think before we now go and hand over to um, and I introduce the next speaker, just to re, um, um, refer back to a paper that was long, launched, I think, a, a good year ago now by the um, by, um, by the um, the Ramsar Convention Secretariat about the need for to take action, where it's very clearly identified, and I think Jerka will refer back to that. 50 million hectares of peatland need to be re drained. Peatlands need to be rewritten by 2050. It's a big task, but I also really believe with the team and with the magic push that of the the magnificent push that we have at this moment in time, we can do it. So it's really good for me to hear on one side we we've got the tools, the maps here going with Jan and where are they? And from Maria, we've got the the policy frameworks and the policy actions in place. But the next step is, oh, how are we going to do it on the ground? And it would be really good. And that would be nice to introduce you to the, the next presentation. The next presentation is from um, Asadu Sibioto. And I hope I pronounce your, your name correctly, um, Asabu. Um, it's, um, Asabu is the Senior Wetland Officer of the Wetlands Management Department in the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. And he's going to talk to you about what's happened in Uganda the case study of lessons learned in Uganda. Asabu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. I hope I'm clear. You are. Yeah, thank you very much. And to all participants, thank you for turning into this webinar. Yeah, like the name has been introduced, I'm Asadu Sebioto from the Ministry of Water and Environment, Senior Wetlands Officer. And basically my expertise is in wetlands mapping. So we are going to look at Uganda's case with peatlands. Uh, before we start, next slide. Uh, I need to give you an overview of Uganda because this issue of peatlands, of course, like all environmental scientists, they've been hearing about uh, peatlands and everything, but in Uganda, we are not given a lot of focus to peatlands. And it's a bit unfortunate because you realize Uganda is a country that is almost a wet country because 13.9% of the entire country is full of wetlands. So wetlands coverage in Uganda is approximately 13.9%, which is around 33 square kilometers of the entire country. So this is quite huge. And if we if we try to, to measure and see how much of this are peatlands, you might find that we have potential of making sure that we use our peatlands in the indices and put a lot of focus on them for climate mitigation. We first got to know about, first, we first got to, to undertake any field work in peatlands with support from Wetlands International East Africa. When we got experts from the Grusso Admire Center, that was basically Dr. Sama, I think he's on. And that's the first time actually as a country, as a ministry, we were able to first understand in depth how important these peatlands can be and how we can assess them and exactly how to, to, to to search for them, basically to map, because that's the first time we had a peatlands map of Uganda. And from that kind of estimate, we had around 6,878 square kilometers of peatlands, and which represented around a carbon content of 0 0.075 kilograms per meter cubed, and a carbon stock estimation of 192 metric tons. So this is quite huge. And when we did an assessment, we realized that from just the pit studies that we had, this, this percentage of 6,878 square kilometers was around 20.4 of the entire wetlands coverage of the country. So when we go to see the challenges and everything, you realize that of the 13.9% wetlands coverage, if we undertook more studies, if, we, if the country got more experts in peatlands, because at the moment we don't have any, I believe the group that was trained by Wetlands International and Griswold Mass Center, this is the group that has had something and they feel about 
how to assess these peatlands. With all the vast, vast coverage of, of, of the papyrus, of the sages, of everything we have in Uganda. Now it's our job to go down there and try to find out. Next slide. So when we go to about, when we talk about indices, Uganda has been reporting in, in this indices and we've been focusing mainly on our forests. But in the last five years, discussions came in on how, what we call as wetlands, how wetlands come into NDCs. And this discussion was driven and driven until we, we had this study by Griswold Mass Center about peatlands. And that's how we, we were lucky enough to, to get some information, some baseline data to help Uganda include peatlands into its NDCs. And I think in this last COP, Uganda had peatlands in its indices, but because of inadequate data, we still had some of these challenges. And as you can see, our process of development of peatlands into indices, we had the we had the literature studies, we had to rely mostly on those because we didn't have most of the capacity to undertake studies on ourselves. Of course, the stakeholder engagements at national level and local levels, because like wetlands management, peatlands management in Uganda is decentralized. So each local government has the right and has the powers to manage these peatlands for themselves. So with consultation with most of these uh, local governments and us as the ministry at the national level, we try to, to get some information. And that's how Wetlands International with support from Richard Mass Center came in and we, we did the first, that was the first field work and I was part of it in, uh, to, to, to know like what peatlands are in Uganda and, and how extensive they are. So like you can see, the entities were formed by recommendations from the peatland mapping under the NBI, which, was, which is the one I was talking about in collaboration with Wetlands International and us, the Department of Wetlands Management Department. And we are the lead agency in management of these peatlands. So by the time these results came out and the models were made, we couldn't complete, uh, especially the modeling of the wetlands and, and to, to get the exact calculations for peatlands. But we couldn't use this because we believe like the data wasn't enough. And in our plans of 2025, we believe between now and 2025, we should have enough data on pitlands to make sure that our pitlands are, are well reported into NDCs. So what are the, some of the lessons we've learned in, in this process? It has not been an easy process. Like I've said, it's taken us some time until when we got a uh, Griswold Mass Center, we got uh, in touch with, I think that was of recent uh, uh, Sarko Steve Tag, we had the, we had also Wetlands International. That was the first time for all officers, like to get to know about how to do this analysis, how to practically undertake all these studies. And we believe we shall engage more with uh, the development like of the Global Peatlands Initiative, with other potential funders and partners to, to see how we can, we can build capacity for peatlands assessment and the mapping. So one of the lessons is inadequate data in order to support calculations of targets and inform NDC development. Leveraging on the existing networks and institutions to harness the capacity and available data to support the NDC's work. And the process of the development of these indices is elaborate and yet little time is allocated because remember the struggle we had of getting these NDCs, mixing all these resources and because literally Uganda is a country that survives on natural resources. So mixing all these aspects of natural resources and see which including the entities which are not included is quite a, a long process and the time is, is, is actually less with ex the expertise itself. And like I've said, the process requires funding for data collection, analysis and reporting. And like I've said, we've only had two field works in Uganda's pitlands and all these field works have been with support from Griswold Mass Center and Sarko Steve Tag, NBI, the Nile Basin Initiative, and Waterlands International. Literally, as government, we've not yet undertaken any field work because we believe there's still capacity gap. And without causing this capacity gap, we shall continue having challenges. So if as we build more capacity, government can be able to also start investing in undertaking these assessments of, of of carbon in, in our peatlands. Because like I've said, the entire Uganda is covered by peatlands, by wetlands especially. So in these wetlands, we need to understand what amount of peatlands are in all these. There's also need to plan in advance and engage as many stakeholders in the process. And monitoring of achievement of the set targets should be continuous. So when we summarize all these lessons learned, the key lessons I can, I can knock out is uh, basically the capacity, 
there's a lot of capacity that is required for us to be able to harness this potential of Uganda in peatlands and their carbon sequestration capacity. Because we have them and we believe with capacity, we can have a lot of data and information about our peatlands. So some of the challenges, like I've said, the data was not enough and that's affected our modeling of the indices reporting because the peatlands mapping did not cover all peatlands in the country. Like I've said, out of the estimated 13.9% of the entire country coverage, only like around 6,300 was, was mapped. So we believe there is a lot of potential and we cannot model on basing on half, half capacity. We need to do full capacity and so that we can have good modeling of these indices. Then we also had limited capacity to analyze the data and estimate the mitigation potentials. And these are some of the things we need to, to build upon. So, and what's, what is like our way forward, we need to build capacity in pitland mapping, estimation of carbon, mitigation capacity of pitlands, among others. Like at the moment, we have only like, I think three officers of government that have ever gone to field and understand really what it takes to, to undertake a pitlands assessment. But still, we didn't even proceed to the process of like maybe the laboratory work where we capture the carbon and everything. But at least we got to know the pit coring and, and everything, and we believe we are moving in the right uh, direction with more partnerships and support. So we also believe that there is need for equipping the water management department and other river institutions doing the work on pitlands. Like for those who were with us in the in the field, you realize that we are using most of the district staff. So as we get this capacity, it's our role to make sure that we send this capacity down to, to the local governments because that is our job. And all this comes with equipping things like pit corers. I think we, we only have, I think like one pit corer that was provided to us by the GIZ after our assessment with the with NBI. So with this capacity, we shall be able to have better information and update our NDCs in 2025. Uh, can we proceed? So basically, like, as we talk, we cannot only talk about ourselves as, as a country because most of Uganda's woodlands, which some, like we've said, majority are, might be pitlands, are transboundary. And we have to leverage on our transboundary capacity as, as, as the hosts of the Ramza Center for Eastern Africa to make sure that we also expand this initiative to, to other East African countries. It's because these, these resources no, don't know any boundaries. And, However much you try to conserve peatlands on our side and Kenya doesn't conserve or and Tanzania doesn't conserve whether South Sudan or the Democratic Republic of Congo, it will be a waste of time. So we've tried to bring in this element of, uh, of regional management and transboundary management. And we, in our last meetings, we agreed on certain aspects that we have to undertake as we, we go into this series of making sure that every country includes its peatlands into the NDCs, every East African country under the Ramza Center for Eastern Africa, which is the Ramza Regional Initiative of East Africa and is hosted by the Minister of Water and Environment of Uganda. So we agree that our first priority is to map out and rank all peatlands at both regional and national levels to provide the basis for development strategies for sustainable management of these critical areas. So first of all, we have to know where these peatlands are. We have to map out because some of these countries don't even have wetlands maps. So as we go into peatlands and building capacity for all these, we have to make sure that we know where these peatlands are. We have to map and also rank because like I've said, Uganda everywhere is wetlands. So as we go for the issues of rewetting, of restoration, we also have to rank which ones are more affected and which ones are, are more important. So we have the second priority we agreed as, as a region was to conserve all pristine and semi-natural peatlands and prevent all new drainage and use. For example, I've had the, some questions coming in of generation of energy from these peatlands. We've had similar requests of some companies requesting for generation of energy in pitlands. And as a country, we are refusing this and because we have other alternative energy sources. So we believe it is better to leave these pitlands intact. So we're also putting focus on protecting those ones that are intact and restoring the ones that are being degraded. And so far we are undertaking some restoration projects, some supported by UNEP, others supported by UNDP and the Green Climate Fund to make sure that we restore and reweight our pitlands. So third priority is to restore critically degraded wetlands and pitlands, which I've just talked about. So that we fit into the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. Fourth priority is to reweight drained and degraded pitlands and find adaptable traditional innovative value chains. So what we are doing as we reweight these pitlands for, for the 
literary sources we have as we relate to these peatlands, we make sure to provide alternative sources of livelihood to these communities. So that instead of them surviving on peatlands, sorry, they have to they have other sources of income that can take them off the peatlands. Then fifth priority is to engage and build capacity of regional uh, initiative uh, of, of, of our region through Ramzea and local stakeholders that have management of peatlands. So we have to make sure this message of peatlands cuts across our, our region and everyone understands that peatlands have a role to play into in our targets as in our targets for the UNF Triple C. Then sixth priority is to develop land use policies include the multi-sectoral approach to ensure that drainage-based development does not expand further. So this, we are also trying to bring in this, especially for the case of Uganda nowadays, everything, every project is handled at a multi-sectoral level. So, so that no sector is affected by the other, whether it's the energy sector, the environment sector has to be involved. And this can be very important. And to talk about like the legal frameworks for the sake of Uganda, we've, we've built some legal frameworks to make sure that even if we develop more pitland capacity, we have the resources, we have the laws to make sure that everything goes uh, goes on well. Uh, the legal frameworks, we, we have the National Environment Management Act that was, the old one was repealed and we created a new one to, include in, to, to bring in these new issues, emerging issues. That one was of 2019. We have the National Climate Change Act and this helps us in the indices and, and everything. We have the Wetlands Management Bill, we are processing this and as we got to know about the pitlands, we are going to include pitlands management into our national wetlands management bill. So that by the time it becomes an act, we have we shall have sections on specifically pitlands. But to make sure this goes through through the parliament, we have to have enough information and enough data. And these are the things that we request partners and, and funders to, to come up and help us uh, achieve well. Because I want to assure you that when it reaches parliament level, we shall need information and data to convince the lawmakers to understand that pitlands have a role to play in our climate uh, targets. And without these pitlands, especially for a country that is basically like 13.9 is too much. So if we don't include this into our act and into our process, so we have a, we have an opportunity that this bill is under process. So we, we have to look for the data and we make sure that pitlands have a base to push this act forward. We also have a national trans management policy and this helps us in management of our wetlands. So, like for the, in terms of the legal frameworks, I think we've tried to, to put in place most of these. What is lacking basically is the data. We need the data, we need the, the resources, we need the equipment. And basically those are the, the three things that we have to, 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 to base on and, and make sure that even we, as we do most of these courses, like in the institutions of higher education, our universities, as people do, do uh, like we call them like uh, courses on, on wetlands, we need to start initiating in pitlands in these courses on wetlands because like personally when we are doing these courses doing our undergraduates doing our postgraduates they didn't cover anything about pitlands but if we are to achieve our climate targets pitlands have to come in because i'm sure uganda has enough of them so we need to also bring this into our schools and our universities so that they, they review their courses and including these aspects of pitlands uh, thank you very much thank you very much asadu that was brilliant it's so nice to hear um what's going on from your perspective, what's happening in your country. Um, very strategic approach of, and I'm always impressed by the huge amount of peatlands and wetlands and peatlands present in, in your country. But then how you've gone through that, how you said, actually, this is our responsibility. We need to work with it. And to be able to do that, we've got our priorities lined up very clearly on how to go with from A to B to C to D. And that you then come up and say, actually, it's resources. It's, um, it's capacity and it is the way on how to do it and bring that capacity also not get it for only from outside, but bring that into, into your own country. So it's great to hear that and it's just an inspiring story that you're telling. So thank you for sharing that with us. There are some questions in the, in the chat, but as a moderator, I can always ask the first question and I always do that. And one of the questions that I had um, and that I asked to, to others as well, and I think you've partly outlined that about priorities, and that was great to hear. It's the data, the data drives policy, but the data you only can, can get if you've got the right resources and the right capacity to develop that. So that's very clear. What I did not get myself, and I think that is thinking beyond the mapping and knowing the damage and knowing the state, we look thinking about solutions. So how, what, is the, what are the main reasons for the drainage? 
and how can we turn that into a future whereby the the people and the communities are brought together and brought with us to kind of drive that future forward because that's what we see a lot of, across the planet is that the communities need to be part of that future so the question is really is what's the the driver it's drainage but is that drain what's that related to and how do you see the the involvement of communities into shaping that future yeah thank you hans uh, uh like this issue of wetlands management and everything in uganda basically became an issue in beginning from 1995. before 1995 literally wetlands in uganda were considered as wastelands and that's where i would find garbage being thrown that's where i would find waste being drawn or factories were openly draining into wetlands because these were considered as wetlands. Like I've said, they were like they cover a lot. So people used to think mm -hmm. these are, are wetlands. But from 1995, when government got to understand the role these most of the, these wetlands play into our information, because mm -hmm. like like you see, a country like Uganda is predominantly, predominantly ag 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 agrarian. Like we depend on agriculture for our survival. Mm -hmm. So if you look at if you look at most of us, like 80 percent of the economy is basically reliant on agriculture. And this agriculture is rain-fed agriculture. This is not commercial agriculture. So mm -hmm. with, with like as climate change came in, people started seeing this, that eh, we used to have two rainy seasons in a year. So because we used to know that between when March starts, prepare your land for growing because rain is coming in April. But until people started realizing that the rains that they had prepared for in April have come in May, that's when now government started coming in and saying, ah, what is the problem? And that's when scientists started coming in, the, the destruction of forests, destruction of wetlands, and what can government do? So that's why we mostly have most of these laws on environment and, and, and climate change started in 1995, when mm -hmm. these impacts of climate change started biting. So you realize that as, as these laws came in, of course, challenges come in implementation. And by then, the country had a low population. So you realize that the drivers of most of this drainage the drivers of, of of most of this drainage come from population increase mm -hmm. so as wetlands as wetlands like before 19, 1995 they are called wetlands now after 1995 as the population started growing into the 2000s you realize that for example especially in urban areas land land that land for construction was uh, practically not affordable for most of the low-income earners so they resorted to wetlands as a source of cheaper land so now wetlands we are all pressures were being dated into wetlands. Like mm -hmm. factories that wanted cheaper land, they were going for wetlands. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 families that wanted cheaper land for, for settlement, they were going to wetlands because mm -hmm. these were cheap lands and they couldn't afford highlands and, and, and everywhere. So most of the industrial parks, they went for wetlands because that's where they would get that's where they would get cheap land. And this explained like the biggest uh like sources of drainage because population grew, demand increased, even the demand for food. So previously okay. we had communities that never used to grow anything in wetlands, but because okay. of the increased demand of food, people had to go into wetlands to start growing food there. Mm -hmm. And you realize that like of this 13.9% of wetlands coverage I've been talking about, you realize that we only have 9% that you can see as intact. The balance mm -hmm. is the balance is degraded. And when yeah. we set our targets as a country, we have the National Development Plan 3, and we have the Uganda Vision 2040. We said we must take the intact wetlands back to 12% at least. And that's the target that our minister is riding towards, and that's the target that the department is focused on. And mm -hmm. that's why we are happy when we get to understand how the pitlands and everything, because in all these things we are doing, we need political support. Like we understand we cannot manage this environment without political support. So of recent, we've we've been getting a lot of the political support because we've mm -hmm. not been able to get that on wetlands. And if we get more data on pitlands, I believe the political support will even double. So if you've been watching most of the presidential national national addresses, mm -hmm. there's no national address that our, our president has made in the last two years where he has not talked about wetlands restoration and advising people to leave wetlands because. He's the biggest like ad advocate of of wetlands restoration, and he has been requesting people to uh, to freely and willingly leave wetlands, mm -hmm. so that government can, can provide them with alternative sources of income. Because we know these people have gone there because they're looking for survival, they're looking for food, they're looking for incomes. So as a government, if you want to wet these wetlands, if you want to restore them, are you just going to take people out? And because if you take them out, they will go back if they don't mm -hmm. have what to eat. Because everyone exactly. wants to. Eat. 
what we are trying to do is we are trying to, to even when we are developing projects of reweighting and restoration, one of our key focus areas that we always tell the donors is that we need alternative sources of livelihood. Mm -hmm. So as we focus on the restoration part, which is easy because we understand like most of our returns don't need even more than 12 months to reweight. The moment people get out, our returns have, have the water. But if we don't keep people out, because what keeps them out is if they have food on their table. So we have to make sure as we take them out, we have to put food on their table, give them skills mm -hmm. that can help them survive from, except digging woodlands. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yes. No, absolutely. It's great to hear because that is, as you're more than aware, Asado, that's a very similar picture actually across the world, whereby we need the local support of the communities so that they understand why they need to leave the wetlands, but also the, the people have gone there because there was food or there was building materials or there was um, 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 materials they could burn to keep their houses warm. Yeah, so there's been a reason why people were there. And if we understand what those reasons were and how we can help them with other alternative sources of food, of, of shelter, of of warmth, then we can really make that change that is not only coming from the top, as you say, from the policy and from the politics, but is also coming bottom up and then the communities change and then we've got lasting action. So it's great to see how you've got that incorporated in there. And the question that I asked earlier on to Maria, how are you going to turn all these NDCs into action? You've gone a long way already to see and actually on how to make that happen because you understand how you want to make that to turn it forward. So thank you. Um, we're slightly running behind time now in our in our thing, but that's not a problem. We've got plenty of time in our in our um, Ask the Expert session, and I hope everybody will stay. Just a reminder again to everybody, if you have any questions to the panel, to the experts that are coming online after the Pigland Restoration video that we're going to watch in a minute, please ask questions through the Q&A um, and, and function on the Zoom at the bottom end in the center, there's a Q&A button. Ask the questions there and then we pick them up further in the, uh, in the panel discussion that's happening after this restoration video. Um, that rests me to now um, introduce that peatland restoration video. Um, we're coming back, as I said at the beginning, I am based at the moment in Scotland. We're jumping from Africa. We've been all over the all over the world. And now we are back into, for me, back and nearly into my back garden. Well, not really my back garden, but a few hundred kilometers north of where I live. And that's an example of work I've been also been involved with people restoring um, peatlands in the Scottish Highlands. Um, there's a, a short video of a company that we're working with that is actively restoring and actually using young people straight from school and from high school to really restore peatlands. So we're going to listen to this and um, we got, it's going to be played now. And But please in the background, um, push, your, uh, push that out your questions and I'll see you all back again in six minutes. Welcome to the Scottish Highlands, home to the vast majority of Scotland's degraded peatlands, which currently are 80% degraded. So today we're going to head up the hill and show you some of the incredible work that we're doing here at Caledonian Climate. So come on board. Specialist equipment, such as these all-terrain vehicles, are sometimes required to access some of the remotest sites that we work on. But access is just one of the many factors that we consider when we're looking at the feasibility of a site. Let's hear some more about this. The feasibility is the first part to working out whether a project is viable or not. You need to work out the access, stakeholder engagement, such as Scottish Water and Bird Protection Agency. Uh, you also need to do habitat impact assessment, so deer grazing and trampling on your site. And then finally, you need to do peak depth surveying with this which works out literally the depth of your site, where it starts and where it finishes. And you can do it like this. <sighs> 150 centimetres. This is a really good example of a restored peatland site. We've re-turfed the bare peat on the bank and then we've created a dam here, which allows a pool to form behind. The operators who do this work have to develop the skills to do this type of work. And in the Highlands, we have a saying that they have to be able to read the ground. That means they can identify the suitable vegetation 
and the suitable sites for dams to allow the formation of pools like this, which we reseed with sphagnum, and then that allows the bog forming process to start again and just lets nature work its magic. Come here, come here, come here, come here. good lad, sit there, sit there, good lad. So one of the, I guess, most iconic species that we're looking at in this habitat is sphagnum, and there are a number of different species, but one of the key ones really in, in, in water is, is, is cuspidatum. So sphagnum cuspidatum was used in the First World War primarily for its antibacterial properties, but it also stores a huge amount of water, as you can see. It's, it's that capacity that, that allows us to, to create a, a, a functioning bog system, and it's integral to the health of the whole, the whole habitat. Degraded peatlands emit over 20 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents annually. That's around 4% of the total UK greenhouse gas emissions. While peatland represents one of the most effective nature-based solutions to climate change and biodiversity loss, there's a myriad of co-benefits that come with it. So here I'm stood next to a hydro scheme that's showing a demonstrable 15% improvement in power generation. By raising the water table and keeping water on the hill, we're reducing the fire risk to delicate peat landscapes and stopping the flashy runoffs that go downstream and cause flood risks lower down the valley. We're also creating green local jobs that are sustainable in what can be fra fragile highland economies. That, coupled with biodiversity, are all the great reasons why peatland restoration is so important. So a functioning bog system, one of the things it does, it promotes a healthy invertebrate population, such as dragonflies and mayflies, uh, water spiders, and these kind of species. These then feed into the kind of small mammalian populations that we find common in here, such as field voles and water voles, which are, in, are really important in this habitat. And from there, you start to see other species coming in, such as golden eagle, peregrine falcon, and hen harrier. As we head back down the hill, we're reflecting on the size of the challenge ahead of us to ensure that we protect our climate and our planet for generations to come. Scotland currently requires 1.4 million hectares to be restored by 2050. That's an annual target of 60,000 hectares per annum. There are challenges in delivering that, the main one being a steady funding stream to allow that work to actually take place. All of our projects are independently verified and validated under the Peatland Code. Carried out by skilled contractors like John, we ensure that all of our projects are done to a world-class standard. And our overriding ambition is to increase the speed and scale required across the Scottish landscapes to achieve the government's targets. Thank you. Um, I'll be going back again. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. And um, I hope you enjoy that. Um, sorry if it was a bit of a, a too many company names here. Um, what I really was, was showing is that there is real action happening on the ground. What is also really showing, I think for me, is that it can be done on the commercial bay and it includes people and, and it includes the, the, the living landscape whereby the communities and the contractors stay within the areas and rekindle the communities on the ground. So it's an integrated solution. And just as we spoke uh, to the presentation just before this one with Asadu, whereby the communities and the people need to understand why, why they and how they should interact and work with the peoples and how important it is for them. And also how important it is that they see a livelihood coming from this. So let's move on now to the next uh, phase in the, in our uh, in our webinar and we still got we've got a whole series of good questions coming in um, and I'm really pleased about that and so I'd like to um, to make sure that you use the Q&A box at the bottom to ask your questions we will bring them in and we also will be delving into the questions that were raised not only during the previous webinar but also also during the the COP sessions at Sharm El Sheikh recently where we um, highlighted again the, the importance of peat. So what I'd like to do is 
see if we can get the rest of the experts onto the onto the screen and i'm very quickly going to introduce you to the the experts so on one side we've got um if people switch our experts switch on their, their cameras that would be great so we've already seen um, Maria and uh, Maria and Elizabeth um, Rams Beltran and Eva from the FAO, Jan and Peters and Asama El Selawi from um, the Greifswald Meyer Center. Then we've got Jerka Tamalander, if Jerka is still there and switches on his camera as well from the Ramsar Convention Secretariat. Diana um, Kopanski from UNEP, uh, the um, Global Peatland Initiative. And from Wetlands International, I've got myself and Cynthia there. And I think that's roughly the um, the, uh, the 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 experts that we got around the table. So we've got an, an about ooh, about twenty five minutes or so to go some of the main questions. And first of all, thank you all for joining our panel, and thank you for being part of this. I think it's important. Um, one of the big key things that keep coming up, and that keep coming up is. How important, and I don't think we've we've really delved into that, is how important are these peatlands to preserve to preserve them in under climate change? I started re alluding to one of the reports, for example, um, Jelka that came out just be uh, just before the last COP. So how important are the peatlands? And what is really is there an in is what's happening as a resultant of climate change in these peatlands? Jelka and others, please come to come in. Well, thanks, Hans, and also um, like to echo some comments in the chat I've seen about the quality of the presentations before, and also the quality of the questions we're getting in the Q and A. That's uh, that's fantastic. Um, maybe a, quite a general answer, and I think other panelists will weigh in with more. But uh, based on the work that many of you were involved in under the scientific and technical review panel of the Convention on Wetlands, it's clear that the importance of peatlands to the climate situation is, is enormous. In fact, it is very unlikely that we'll be able to meet the goals established in the Paris Agreement without enormously ambitious peatlands actions, and that entails preventing further degradation, further drainage, and further loss of peatlands, and it entails uh, re-wetting and restoration at a, a previously unprecedented scale. We're talking about 50 million hectares that really would need to be restored, re-wetted uh, by 2050 if we are to stay within a somewhat safe space. So, of course, peatlands are not uh, uh, the only tool in our toolbox. Emission reduction is imperative, but at, uh, as things currently stand, we need to harness every, every uh, method at our disposal. And in terms of ecosystem-based action, peatlands are absolutely critical. And I think uh, some of the publications I mentioned before, perhaps I can drop into the chat, uh, the, the links into the chat, but um, maybe I'll stop there and let other panelists weigh in as well. Well, I would like to jump in onto that, into one my panel, and I also obviously Asado, please, please also feel free to to answer any of the questions that are coming through. Maria, yeah, thanks. We're totally on the same side. We're talking still uh, um, that peatlands are emitting. I think the GPA was now estimating four to five percent. So this number, this proportion, has stayed the same since two thousand and fourteen. I mean. It's 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 a relatively high. We're talking about similar scale than the aviation and shipping emissions combined. So, if you think about how how much the airplanes emit, <laughs> we need to get also to to um to stop the peatlands from uh, emitting. So, indeed, I think that's something the scale the scale of action and and the time is really running out. Uh, there are really good articles. Maybe we can put that in the chat as well. If we're not starting the restoration efforts effectively from now on, it's very unlikely to uh, be able to get to the target limit um, temperatures. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. And I think that's what I <clears throat> have been raising a couple of times today as well and say, we need to get, get on with it now. And it's quite interesting to hear from Asado as well. He said, actually, we need capacity. Yeah, we also need to know how to do it and we need to train of people on the ground. Diana, you'd like to wade in. Thanks so much. I just want to echo that and just emphasize it. If we're looking at uh, our climate commitments as well as, as the upcoming global biodiversity framework, so targets for protection and action, peatlands are a critical ecosystem because they are 
entirely disproportionate to the size to the size and area that they cover on the earth. So I think that you know if we're going to say don't touch any ecosystem, it's really you know important that we acknowledge that these super high carbon ecosystems are uh, should be considered and prioritized not only just for their carbon but also for the resilience and protection they they provide for floods for 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 um for uh, also entire watersheds mm -hmm. and also as drinking water people are are really reliant on on peatlands for the drinking water. So it's this disproportionality that makes peatlands quite an important ecosystem to prioritize. Because they are seen as sort of wastelands or wetlands, there's a lot that also have not been touched yet. So if we can, uh, we need to urgently act and protect those. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Diana, absolutely right. I, completely, I couldn't echo that more, it's really important. I've got a query here coming in as well, and that's more towards our second presentation from Jan um, around the, um, the, glo the global peatlands map. Um, in terms of the map itself, how could, how could um, actors, and not only state actors, but for example, companies of local actors, how could they utilize that resource, that amazing resource that you've built to really focus or prioritize that? Is that easy for them to get into that? Is, uh, is, is it focused at the moment on NDCs? How can you, can you see a, a route into that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, which we also get quite often. Um, as I described in my presentation, this is um, a major step to bring together all this data from different sources. So we used uh, more than 200 different sources, actually different layers. And some of these layers are actually like confidential uh, state data, which we cannot share, which we also cannot put online, like on a like a higher resolution. So this map is available. You can, you can see it, everyone can use it. But of course, at the moment, it's not ready to zoom in like individual sites, for example. You, we, we, as what, what I showed also in my presentation, you will find it in the, in the assessment, is that we, we zoom in on regions so that you get a good idea if you are, have your operation, for example, running in uh, Northwestern Germany, you can, you can look on the map and you will see, okay, there are peatlands. But of course, then if you really want to know if, the specific site you're working on or mm -hmm. which your operation is impacting, then you need to get in contact either with a local administration, if they don't have it, uh, get in contact with, with higher level administrations or um, uh, at, at the end, you can always contact uh, the, the global peatland database team and, and we will try to um, supply the data if we can. But uh, this is actually the next step, of, of course, that we would also like to set up a, a platform and an easily accessible um, frame, framework where you can access the data. But this uh, still requires uh, some thoughts and some, um, yeah, some, some further developments. Thanks, Jan. And also, obviously, Jan, I, I addressed you, but we've got Samer here as well, who is co-author of the same uh, same report. So, Samer, please drop in if I ask a question to Jan. It's against the, uh, across the, um, the piece. So, also for you, it's, um, it's really interesting to see because we get a lot of queries from, from actors that say, where shall we focus? Which peatland shall we go for? And obviously, I understand that there is data the data data issues with that, but it, it might be that there might be just a, a point of of call. Um, it's people can access can can find the right owner of that layer and then access that. Is that the correct way of doing that? And is that easily achievable from the from the from the report? Um, yeah, so I think you have answered the kind of partly the question. So um, for people, this layer is just an indication. People can use it to like see where the peatlands are, but then there is an issue of resolution, of course. So the resolution is large on a global scale. So for mm -hmm. site, specific site or for specific nation, there needs to be maybe when the data is being uh, transferred into a smaller resolution, then that needs to be taken by care. And people need to ground through the data again and check the quality of the data. 
and um, also check on the sources. Um, so I think in the global peatland database, there's not an issue to like try to uh, collaborate to provide uh, more information when available. Um, but as Jan said, there are a lot of different composites and different points of view uh, of inputs for this domain. So it's not like um, very easy to just go on every region and have the same quality. So some regions have high resolution, some regions don't. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is uh, up to the scale of the focus uh, person to see how the data fits and then work through that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Amar. And it is already a massive improvement because we've got now a really good view overview over the world. Where are the peatlands? Um, Diana. I just want to augment that and just say how important it is to also map the projects that you're doing. So the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration has a, a, a functional, you can join there, you can drop in your projects, you can actually, you know, show your geospatial um, mapping of where your project's boundaries are. And that's exactly what we need, because I think people that are working on the ground need to know who their neighbors are and also to create create a community across that. So not only is it important to have these global maps, uh, but also this local map of who's doing what. So uh, I will point to that resource in, on the on the chat, but please do if you have uh, an active peatlands restoration and conservation um, work, because the restoration decade is not just about restoration action, but also by, about protection, put it on the map and you can tag it as peatlands. Thanks. Perfect, Diana. It's great because I I I I, I, sh I like to to echo that as well. That the local is really important as well. Jerka, your an, an intervention from you, and then I will pick up another question from the floor. Uh, yeah, sorry to extend this, uh, but uh, I just to agree very much with uh, with what Diana and, and Samir uh, have said, and and to emphasize that when we speak about getting these peatlands into national level climate plans, you need that data in the right place and supporting the national decision making and planning process. And so the global mapping effort has been enormously important in, in making a global case, providing a global, globally consistent baseline, if you wish, and, a, and, a, and a tracking, it can inspire and support national efforts. But when, where action probably will do the most good in terms of getting peatlands into climate action is at the national level, and that's where it has to happen, and building and leveraging those national uh, data systems. Uh, and it's really good to hear the example that we just heard earlier about from Uganda on how that has actually been done and how that effectively we can be done and we can learn from there that capacity building is needed and I think that's one of the lessons learned from me already during this webinar is that building that capacity might be a really good way of enabling action around the world. One of the questions that I picked up and that is quite a one coming home to, to myself as well from the from the, the questions on online is I was struck by the map of which countries mentioned peatlands in their NDCs so that so few countries, wealthier nations in Europe and North America mentioned peat. Many of the mechanisms to push the conservation seem to relate to funding activities for the less wealthy nation, which is great, but how do we push Europe to get it on board as well? So Maria, in terms of in that, is that is that really something coming out of your analysis or is that a fluke or is that a fact? Yes, that, that is, but let's remember that many countries, uh, including the US, Northern uh, America, uh, Europe as well, uh, in Russia, other, other areas, there are a lot of uh, activities going on. They just may not mention them in the NDCs as a key commitment document. And, and also in the EU level, there seems to have been, for example, a decision that let's just go, you know, the NDC is relatively short and they use it like a large concept as Petlands is a, like a, an umbrella concept yeah. for many different types of areas. So that's why it has kind of eaten the Petlands. So let's not uh, be too negative about this, but indeed, and, and of course there's a nature restoration law that we had also in our presentation that Elizabeth has shared in the chat. Um, that there, there are also indeed we are expecting like quite large scale action from different regions 
um, even if they wouldn't necessarily mention them separate, separately in the NDCs. But look, good to look at also the greenhouse gas inventories that the countries are uh, mm -hmm. doing and, and other kind of reporting mechanisms out there. Their different countries are accounting for their emissions for peatlands as well. Not all. Thank you, Marie. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Marie. Sorry, Louis. <laughs> I heard somebody else. Jan is picking up on that one. Jan. Yeah, it, it's correct what Maria said, but we, we also should see that it's also, of course, a, a question of global uh, justice and, and uh, just transition because we have actually uh, in many, many countries of the north and especially in Europe, we have huge amounts and huge percentages of, of drained peatlands, um, which makes the European Union actually the second largest emitter mm -hmm. of greenhouse gases exactly. from peatlands worldwide uh, after Indonesia. And Indonesia is actually taking a lot of measures. They, they take huge efforts and they have um, set up an agencies, they set up regulations and, um, and policies, which uh, we at the moment don't see uh, that much in, in, in Europe. So there is still a lot to do. And uh, I think this, this, this question should be kind of a, a push to, to many of the uh, governments also from Europe, but also from North America to actually acknowledge peatlands more and not just as a part of wetlands, but name it <laughs> and um, uh, then also uh, put the measures in place to really restore, re-wet and use the peatlands in a, in a climate friendly way. Thanks, Jan. Um, I, com I completely agree from the, the countries that we are involved in. Some of the countries put the peatlands on the face of their NDCs. Some of them are hiding them under all kinds of categories. So it would be really good to, to bring that to, to the face. And if we can lose and, and, and support that and get a greater clarity, that would be great. Diana, you would like to create an, another intervention in here? Please do. Just to add another layer on that, and uh -huh. indeed, I think that, you know, the Global Peatlands Initiative initially um, working directly just with tro tropical peatland countries, but inevitably, you know, we need to raise that awareness across the entire world. And we have seen actually through our interactions with all countries of the world, um, policies, programs, and plans being put in place uh, in, in the global north. So Germany has actually created, a, had created a, a unit, a specialized group, and also a policy and plan, as well as these emerging initiatives, which are really quite exciting. Uh, some, some sort of uh, transnational initiatives, Canada, a group of Canadian uh, peatlands experts and, and stakeholders just got funding to create and, and sort of investigate a Canadian peatlands network. How do we look across territories, provinces, and at the federal state uh, level um, to tackle peatlands? Um, so that's a can peat uh, project, as well as we're seeing discussions bubbling up again, uh, brought forward by the Irish government um, on creating a European peatlands in, uh, initiative. And of course, Wetlands International, Geisfeld, Eurosite, and other partners are very much uh, a part of that discussion and dialogue because there is an opportunity here. And when we work across borders, uh, that's when um, we can get uh, further, I think more ambitious, as well as more equity, uh, you know, fairer trade, fairer uh, accounting, and also more appropriate action that um, you know, in some cases, peatland systems are transboundary. So looking at that landscape, looking across boundaries and borders, and we are seeing that movement both in the global south, but also in the global north. Thanks. Thank you, Diana. And that really leads me to the last little topic I'd like to address within this, this panel before we move on to the, the last 20 minutes in our webinar, Time is Flying. It's great to hear all the insight and that's also shared and echoed by the comments on the, um, on the chat and in the questions. And that's the issue around communities, livelihoods. Yeah, we've started picking that up already in the presentation by Maria very clear in the presentation from Azadu, if we think about how are we going to solve this. Jan mentioned it as well in terms of the, um, the polluted culture and local solutions. So that's really what your views are. And that's a question as well coming from the, from the floor. Um, 
on one side, communities are important, livelihoods are important. On the other side, landscape and large scale units are the units because it's hydrology that functions across a, large, um, a larger area and a larger landscape. So on, in how far do we will need to work on larger scale areas, landscapes, and then how far do we need to bring communities in there? Panel, what's your view? I think um, maybe I can answer that because we have had this discussion uh, last week at the Greifswald Center that uh, mm -hmm. one of the um, terminologies that was coined by the Indonesian government was the Speedland Hydrological Unit, which in the essence uh, may be uh, something to transfer to the rest of the world. Also, like to think of peatlands management as part of the larger landscape and just look at the catchment or the watershed or however hydrological terms may be, and then see how the peatland interact with the different ecosystems and different land use types that are in this within this catchment, um, so that to realize um, what the impact of restoration may have on the positively or negatively on the other ecosystems or the other units in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes also the hydrological parts. So maybe in some cases when we think about uh, mountains uh, where headwater peatlands may exist on top of rivers and then that may go even beyond the catchment or beyond the watershed that the peatlands impact a river or the continuity of a river or the um, how do you say that the river wouldn't dry out throughout the year or something like that and that could go down to lower stream areas so that could go also beyond this one hydrological unit but this is something um, may be more complicated to address, but it is one of the considerations you have to keep in mind when you're in a peatland in the highland or at the source of the water, how that reaches out. Um, so of course, this is uh, has to be dealt with across different landscape, putting in mind mm -hmm. how a peatland addresses the rest of the landscape and how can we um, retract that point back again. Thanks, Amo. And I think just echoing that as well from our experience, um, it's not, so the the way on how wetlands very often sit or, or sit between the rain falling and the water and end, ending up kind of in in the seas again, wetlands are the, the kind of intermediate part, and that's really that functionality as well. And even if we see that not only in the wetter areas or in Scotland, whereby we just saw that small short video that a as a result of a flattening of a hydrograph, a hydropower scheme increasing its efficiency by 15%. That's a real economic benefit. Yeah. But on the other hand, in terms of growing crops in arid areas, whereby peatlands in the in Africa are storing huge amounts of water from the wetter season towards the drier season, creating base flows and creating groundwater flows, discharging and are being useful and can be used as, as irrigation water. So it is directly linking that hydrological functioning and that watershed functioning, I think, to the to the livelihoods and the communities. And as Asado already said earlier on in this presentation, we really need to show the community and the people on the ground as well. So how important it is to care for those peatlands, to care for those areas in the landscape that really make the landscape tick, that really makes that hydrological functioning. So it's great to see that. And it was one of the questions picking up and you, you echo that as well. And you're absolutely right. What's happened in Indonesia, the hydrological units might be an, an, interesting, an interesting concept to migrate from wider across because that then ties easier back towards water and but that ties easier back towards communities and water was a main, major topic at COP. So that brings me towards the end of the, the stakeholder of the, sorry, our panel discussions. If any of the panelists would like to make a quick statement, that would be great. Otherwise, I go to the last 15 minutes or so of this, um, of this webinar. It's been great hearing your input and thank you uh, so far for your, for your input, dear panelists. I can't see any hands raised, so we move on to the, the last um, section of this, uh, this webinar. I've learned a lot, I must say. We've seen quite a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A and we really keep moving forward. The next speaker on in this last session, we've got uh, three more things lined up. Um, 
the first one is Diana Kupanski, you're the, uh, the coordinator of the Global Peatland Initiative. We've already seen and heard you once or twice, Diana, but I would like you to, to, to take five minutes or so to talk about the role of partnerships and the impact of inter international collaboration. That's the section. And after that, we got Romeo Battolini. Diana, the floor is yours for five minutes. You are on mute at the moment. You might need to unmute yes. yourself. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to set up my um, set up my presentation here. Thanks so much. And indeed, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And Hans, great to see you back. Um, you mentioned that I work for UNEP. And as a part of UNEP, I lead the Global Peatlands Initiative. And uh, it's a partnership, a multi-stakeholder partnership that is supported by Germany's International Climate Initiative with additional contributions from Norway and Sweden. So the success for the climate planning and people on a global scale requires global action. And that's exactly why the Global Peatlands Initiative has been working with international partners for results and impact. This is built on experiences that we've heard today and, and from a dynamic um, practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and we really try to bring these approaches and best practices uh, from science to policy and uh, through innovation and financing. And as Jan was mentioning, the GPI was launched at the end of 2016 at the UNFCCC COP in Marrakesh, Morocco, and uh, started with 13 key sort of partners. We've grown to a partnership of 51 members and directly supporting four major tropical peatland countries of Indonesia, Republic of Congo, DRC, and Peru. And these four countries uh, are huge peatland countries, but they also uh, convey a very different reality. Um, Indonesia is in a climate emergency because of their peatlands degradation and drainage, and they're urgently working to protect and restore them. Uh, we've got uh, Peru that has a foot in both realities. Their highland peatlands are degraded um, and affecting the local communities as well as the downstream communities um, because those peatlands provide huge amount of water for uh, cities like Lima, Peru. And then we have the lowland Amazonia peatlands that stretch all the way uh, across into Brazil and some incredible works happening there. We have Dennis Castillo online here that can share some of the dynamic work they're doing with public, private, and indigenous communities uh, participation. Uh, so we really try to, to distill and to um, distribute, you know, these real evidence-based um, uh, results and, and best practices. So the role of GPI is to bring partners together, but also to help through this exchange um, to advance conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of peatlands globally. And uh, our diversity is, our, is an asset, both in our uh, peatlands uh, expertise, but also in those places and uh, communities that we come from. Each of our members is working together within their respective areas to know where peatlands are and understand how they're changing, identify productive uses and drainage-free livelihoods. Uh, we're working with countries to develop and put in place policies, laws, institutions, and frameworks that take account of the uniqueness of peatlands um, and avoid their uh, further degradation. And we're working together to also identify financial solutions and instruments so that we can work together with public and private sectors to invest in healthy peatlands now and in the future. And we've had some great success. Um, we've uh, made some impact. We've got some great best practices to share. Uh, most of the resources can be found on our website, but also uh, through our partnership. We've really um, delivered through a South-South and triangular collaboration, through exchanges, uh, bringing the best science available to, to the attention of policymakers and the public and activating them. Some of the commitments and partnerships include the Brazzaville Declaration, the establishment of the International Tropical Peatland Center, the UNEA Resolution on the Conservation of Sustainable Management of Peatlands, the Peatlands Restoration Guidance, uh, some of the work on the NDCs and the climate commitments, you can see the resources are really coming out from the partners. 
And just uh, where one year ago, we celebrated the importance of collaboration at the COP in Glasgow, where together a number of partners coordinated the first ever global peatlands pavilion. And during those two busy weeks, we got incredible content, 45 knowledge exchange events and networking events, both physically and online. We welcomed 250 speakers. They represented all types of stakeholders and 2,700 uh, 2, people from around uh, 100 countries registered on the online platform. So we're really trying to bring you together to the people that know, that can answer your questions, that they, we are trying to facilitate this act and activate interaction exchanges so that we can scale up efforts and also avoid duplicating efforts and avoid um, repeating mistakes from the past. We also have a, a YouTube channel. Um, you can just Google uh, the Global Peatons Pavilion and you'll find the YouTube channel where all of those sessions are recorded for you to listen back to. Thank you, Diana. And are you wrapping up? I am. And Thank one you. month ago, we celebrated uh, the Global Peatons Assessment. That is a collaborative work. We had more than 260 contributors. Uh, it's the most comprehensive state of the world's peatlands. Um, Personally, I think that the most important thing that we can do to tackle the nature and climate crisis is to work together. So please uh, do join us in whatever capacity you have uh, with, with whatever passion and knowledge you have and be part of the solution. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Diana. And sorry that I was rudely interrupting you, but mm -hmm. I saw the clock ticking away. It's great. Thank you. It's an amazing platform that you're and an amazing um, global community that we got here that's really driving forward action so it's great to celebrate that and please all the all the links to it are in the in the chat and we will sending that out afterwards as well um, thanks so much the the, the, the pre-ultimate speaker we got here in a few minutes uh, five minutes for romeo battolini the deputy director of the country engagement for the ndc partnership and support unit and um, roberto would be great to hear who, how you see your role as the end of the ndc partnership in supporting and the role of partnerships in impacting colla international collaboration. The floor is yours for, I'm afraid, four minutes, I'm afraid. That, that's absolutely okay. Uh, and good to see you again, Hans. Uh, uh, very good to see you after after Glasgow and uh, and uh, also seeing how, how you know, more, more and more uh, actors are coming in here and how this is, a, is really gearing up towards a substantial part of the discussion around NDC enhancement and the C uh, implementation and I think uh, uh, there's there's really a couple of things that that come to mind when 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 uh, uh, Diana just just raised the the work that they're doing and I think on the on the global level when yeah. it comes to uh, you know bringing partners together our 210 members all from regional development banks multilateral development banks bilateral donors icky of course one of the the major through the German Ministry of uh, of Environment back then one of the major supporters of the the peatland uh, um, uh, platform there being being on board and I think what we what we see uh, and what we've been seeing in the in the last year year and a half is really some some uh, additional um, additional uh, act activities there on um, on the on the on the area of uh let me try to move this in the area of uh the peatlands and, and also the ndc implementation and what we and i skipped this for for the reason of uh, 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 uh time and um, so far we've been seeing in our work and this really is increasing about 65 country requests that re reference either peatlands, wetlands, or mangroves. And these requests, and this is only the Global South, by the way, and about the 115 uh, Global South country members that we have are coming from Congo, Peru, uh, Laos, Argentina, Gabon, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, Liberia, Dominican Republic, Mozambique, Belize, Uganda, and Panama. So uh, we, we saw quite some, some uptake here in the especially in the review of the first round of the NDCs. And there's also uh, 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 both uh, an adaptation element to those, but also a mitigation element uh, uh, to, to, to those. And of course, not all of that is in the very narrow sense peatlands, but in the 
in the in the more kind of wider sense, of course, uh, um, uh, all around also uh, landscape restoration and CO two sequestration. Uh, two two. Uh, examples and we heard from from the colleague uh, from Uganda before that there has been under the under the review of the the um, NDC uh, some support from UNDP that we facilitated to support the government to assess costs and investment investment opportunities for nature based solutions and especially the wetland conservation and restoration i think that that was a, a crucial part of 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 a new part of the NDC, and 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 that goes, of course, into the investment planning there, um, and uh, needs to be taken up and uh, now um, basically uh, financed, of course, through national resources, but especially through uh, uh, global global resources that are available for this kind of uh, support. And uh, we had, in the context of COVID recovery, actually a, a technical. Uh, uh, advice on on uh, the from the World Bank, where the Ministry of Planning asked us to design and asked the the, the colleagues, the, the specialists, to design resilience measures to sustainably manage uh, peatlands, mangroves, and forests in order to make make sure that there is not only space for um, uh, uh, stopping the landscape degradation, but also for the future uh, carbon sequestration kind of potential and and transfer of, of of funding and this is i think a, a very important part of of what we're going to see we need to make sure that these kind of ideas and these kind of steps find their way to 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 funding on a larger scale and find the way to to be addressed by the international community and the pledges that they've been doing um number one and number two is also uh, uh, clear that the and you said it before man management of data and assessment of the of the real value of these uh, of these uh, 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 landscapes and, and, and peatlands and so forth are uh, uh, is done in a in a in a manner that allows also to to understand the value when it comes to uh, again sequestration but also to 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 adaptation and resilience so that is extremely important we really try to and we saw it in egypt we really try to make sure that this there is a scale up of finance and there's an increase uh, on in this this area also through uh, carbon uh, market approaches hopefully um, and uh, that that is something i do hope also that uh, cop 15 in, in montreal right now is uh, uh, connecting very closely to 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 the to the climate to the climate cop that we've just been seeing and um, I really believe that 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 needs to be taken up by the international community and there needs to be investment and funding in an intelligent manner ideally also involving not only uh, a public money but also private money. Thanks, Romeo. That's been great. The organization, your organization, the the um, NDC partnership is really doing important work. And so it's great to have you here. Thank you for making time, but also thank you for Diana for making time not only to showcase what the GPI is doing, but also Romeo to showcase what the NDC partnership is doing. And I urge you all where we were talking about earlier about capacity and capacity building and the need to actually to create maps, to create the resources, to get on the on the first steps on that ladder towards inclusion of the NDCs, to understand how you can take action that includes communities, please reach out to the NDC partnership for support as well. It's a great resource besides the stuff that's already on the GPA, GPI portal. So thank you both Diana and Romeo for, for just briefly introdu introducing these, these two big partnership um, groups that are there. Um, I'm just now going to the wrap up and I know we're going to go and we're about a few going to run a few minutes late so my apologies for that I'm trying to keep it to time it doesn't always look but I'm trying to do my best. Um, I'd like to take um, Jerka, Jerka Tamalander, the Director of Science Policy and of the Secretariat for the Convention on Wetlands from Ramsar to take the floor and just grab some some highlight messages that you've picked up. Jerka, the floor is yours for a few minutes. Well, thanks. Uh... Thanks very much, Hans, and I think uh, maybe I will start by also thanking everyone else on the panel 
uh, for for fantastic input, very dynamic exchange, uh, very very well moderated, and of course uh, a very very good input from the audience in the Q and A. So I hope you found that useful. Um, I think it's very difficult to try to summarize the entirety of that very rich discussion, but I think a few things that I want to maybe emphasize at the end in, in, in very brief terms is, is a couple of sort of key messages or opportunities. One is that there is actually a pretty good understanding now of what's actually needed. We, we understand the need. We know much about the situation. It's been documented. Um, we, we know the scale or the, the scale of the ambition that's required. And, and uh, maybe that is, uh, is well understood within a community, it still needs to reach beyond that community. So we need to, uh, to get a more broadly shared understanding of the absolute imperative of doing more about peatlands in the context of climate and sustainable development in general. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we have a fantastic foundation uh, to, to build further on. Um, we know many of the issues that require further attention. The data aspect in particular is important in order to get the quantification we need for better leveraging of climate finance. For example, uh, sometimes we need to, to, to really put in place better definitions, but in most cases, the information is there to do that. One thing that perhaps is, uh, is a stumbling block going back to some of those to some of the questions that were raised is uh, is in relation to opportunity cost we need to be really honest about the fact that maybe there's not an enormous opportunity cost to preventing further degradation there is a significant one in relation to restoring peatland that's in current use and I think that is something uh, um, where uh, uh, there's strong sectoral interest uh, there's a lot of historical uh, elements that that keep you know tend towards a status quo and we need to look at societal value here in a in a really comprehensive way what other real climate benefits that's in not in any way deprioritizing the biodiversity or water benefits on the contrary putting this together you have the societal value of the system that we need to put against the societal cost of business as usual and and that is a basis for a sound decisions in relation to peatlands uh, we need new financing absolutely but we also need much better reprogramming of existing financing and this is again the basis for for that i think maria spoke to this in the original the initial presentation in this webinar and that's a very important element um, maybe the next point is of course that we have ample policy space at the global level now. Uh, many of you will have uh, will have looked at what came out of uh, Climate COP 27, and uh, let's not underestimate the importance of having that formal recognition of the need to uh, use nature-based efforts to achieve climate goals in those negotiated outcomes. That is explicit. Uh, under the Convention on Wetlands, you have resolutions that call on parties to integrate these systems, these ecosystems, uh, in in NDCs, and so. Parties, countries have at the international level taken upon themselves certain uh, key uh, commitments or recognized uh, priorities. And, and so there's ample space to move also in that respect. Uh, we have knowledge, we have policy mandates, we also have a lot of tools. Look at the chat uh, in, this, in this webinar and you can immediately pull a number of those tools uh, that are there. Um, they are quite practical and, and when it comes to the practical, we have the benefit of the lessons parties are willing to share. Uganda in this webinar, uh, we had a previous webinar, we heard from Indonesia, for example. Excellent examples, very, very concrete that, uh, that can promote similar action in, in other countries. So again, there is a lot of real world experience, that real world experience can be stepped up and it can be uh, uh, replicated and tailored to other contexts. So, uh, so really going back to where I started, continued community building, expanding that community and the understanding that we actually have and using tools at our disposal. So, so that's really what I uh, wanted to bring on that last point. Reminder that uh, we're coming up to World Wetlands Day um, on the 2nd of February next year on the theme of restoration and the initial tools for that campaign are already online, worldwetlandsday.org. So uh, please go there and uh, use that opportunity to spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, Jerrica, and uh, let them rest me to do the final wrap up. These were really interesting words, and especially the finance that you pulled out 
is critical, but also not only mobilizing new finance, but also using existing finance streams and directional streams to actually make it happen. At the end of the day, it's also of, of a, an economic decision. So thank you for, first of all, thank you audience. Um, it's been great having you here. It's been great hearing all the questions from you. It's for you, our audience, that we do this because we really would like to work together with you to really drive forward the use of peatlands and include and enhance the peatlands inclusion in NDCs. That's great. And we are there to help and support you to move forward. Thank you for the back office team that has made this possible. Um, they're, they're hiding in the background, but they've done an amazing work to help us set this all up. Thank you for all the speakers <clears throat> who are here. Um, it's been great that you shared your experience, um, that you shared your views, that you shared your understanding. It's really enriched the debate. And thank you as well, for, especially for these the more global um, communities for, for the GPI and for the NDC partnership. They're really important to see them and have them here on board. Just to, as a wrap up to say, say thank you all for being here. It's been a really um, invigorating for me, um, a reinvigorating um, webinar to be part of. And I'm proud to see that. We started off saying we need to, to take action and we see that action is taken and action is being enabled. So I'm really glad to hear that. After this webinar, as you all know, it is it has been recorded. We're going to create a post event package with a link to the recording, the presentations and a link, for example, to the Global Peatlands Pavilion and, and things like the NDC partnership. And we'll make that available probably within the next two weeks and we'll send to all the attendees. And what we really definitely want to do is stay in contact with you community. We want to hear from you and learn from you. What are those issues out there? How can we help you enable you? and empower you to take action, because that's what's, what's, what's important. So what's great in that respect to hear from Asadu, what is really needed for you in, in Uganda? What are you needing for us to help and to, to help us to make a, a real case in terms of data, in terms of action as well? So thank you all for all, and thank you for a really good two hours. I'm going to close up now because it's seven minutes past the second hour, and I've done quite well, I hope. Thank you, have a very nice day, morning, or whatever, wherever part of the day you're in or evening, and we'll speak to all soon, you soon, and I hope to hear you soon as well. Thank you very much, and I'll close this session. Super. Thanks, Hans and team, great job. Thank you, bye-bye.